Now, the untimely death of a child has got to be one of the most painful things any family can suffer through in a lifetime. In this next clip, John connects a family with the young teen boy they lost and astonishes them with details that only this young deceased boy and his family could possibly know. Is there a brother figure here who's passed? Okay, is it connected to you guys? Are you guys related here? Yeah. Okay, so your brother's passed? Who's the middle child? I am. Okay, I'm directing this to you. Oh, you're gonna kill me, I'm sorry. I have to tease you about something outside of your circle of family, even possibly outside of your state, where you were talking about him, where you were talking about a reference, and he's making me feel like, you weren't exactly being as factual as he might have been if he was here. <laughs> Who's the little boy for him? Cousins. They live right next door. Okay, he's acknowledging the little... But he's a little guy. He's a little yeah. So yeah. yeah. Okay. He talks about him all the time. He's acknowledging the, the little guy. Mm -hmm. Did he talk about seeing him after he passed? Um, he talks about him in heaven yes. all the time. And he's in he's his me, heart. And that he's, kind of he's acknowledging this child. As if it's his nephew, like the little guy. He's also telling me to talk about you smelling his jacket or smelling something of his. Do you understand this? like bring it up and smelling it. It's not a shirt. It's like it's got like a texture to it. You just did this. <laughs> this just happened. Might have. Yeah. Where's the place with the up when you walk into the the place where you live when you walk up into it? Okay, you can either go up or down. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, when you go downstairs to your right, is that where there's like a washroom or something? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's where this just happened. You were like smelling this thing. <laughs> it's the place where there's either a sports sticker or something with like a sticker of a team. Where is this room? Maybe it's like a pennant. What is this? Yes, I have pennants all over my room. And I, I, just, uh, I just bought him a pennant for his room okay. recently. Like a, that's like a flag thing, right? Yes. Okay. Because they're showing me the 1986 Mets things. Okay. That's what he's showing me. Who had the very tight curly hair? Tight, tight. It's connected to where the Marcus, or Mark, who is that? My friend Mark. We call him Marcus, and he's got tight curly hair. <laughs> okay. I, and I was, I was, I was just came back from Europe with him. I was over there for six months. I don't know. I was like every day. Okay. Were you busting his chops about his hair there? We always bust his chops about his hair. <laughs> okay. We make him shave it. Okay. Here's the deal. To me, that's your, that's your brother's validation of seeing what's happening in your life, seeing what's happening in your family, connecting and relating experiences to the two of you, stuff that I would not be able to know about, you know what I'm saying, unless they would come through and it's something minute, that kind of stuff that lets us know that they're still with us. Alrighty? Know that he's okay. Thanks. Well. All you have to do is look at the faces of the family members of this deceased young boy to know that John made an amazing connection to the other side for them. And after the show, producers from John's show, Crossing Over with John Edward, followed the Kelly family back home, and the post-interview blew everybody away. My brother, Sean, was not only a brother, but my best friend. Sean was 18 years old when he was um, killed in an automobile accident two weeks after he finished his first year at college. You were talking about him, or you were talking about a reference, and he's making me feel like you weren't exactly being as factual as he might have been if he was here. <laughs> me and my brother always used to joke around about different stories and tell stories in different ways. It reminded me of like him saying, you know what, maybe you're uh, exaggerating a little bit or maybe leaving a different part of the story out that he wouldn't leave out. He's acknowledging the little boy. Did he talk about seeing him after he passed? It's actually Sean's little cousin who lives right next door, and he was very close with Sean. Michael would say, you know, Sean told me this, Sean told me that. You know? And so when John mentioned he's talking to a little boy, we knew right away who it was. He's telling me to acknowledge the rosary beads for him. I do pray the rosary for Sean every day. He's also telling me to talk about you smelling his jacket or smelling something of his. Do you understand this? He caught me off guard there when he said that. The place where you live, when you walk up into it, okay, you can either go up or down. Yeah. Right. Okay, when you go downstairs to your right, is that where there's like a washroom or something? Yeah. Okay, that's where this just happened. You were like smelling this thing. At that point, I was uh, a little in shock. I was a little embarrassed. It's the place where there's either a sports sticker or something with like a sticker of a team. Where's this room? Maybe it's like a pennant? Because they're showing me the 1986 Mets thing. I knew immediately that that was my house and where he was talking about. When you go downstairs to your right, is that where there's like a washroom or something? Yeah. There's either a sports sticker or something with like a sticker of a team. Maybe it's like a pennant. Was they showing me the 1986 Mets thing? I had gone downstairs. I, I wanted to smell my son. I really uh, missed him and I grabbed shirts and um, his sweatshirts and his sweaters. And I just hugged him and I was crying. And there was nobody at all that ever knew that I did that. And something about either the whistle or something about whistling he wants me to remind you about, okay? <laughs> he always used to joke around and kid with me that, you know, 
When he would whistle, the girls would always look right away. When I left, I was floating on air, just knowing that my son was okay. I always believed in an afterlife, but I think it, it, it made my belief even stronger, knowing that he's around and he's seeing what we're doing, and he's still part of our lives. Now, before we ask John to do some readings with our audience, I sat down with him to understand, you know, how John developed this unique talent. For those who don't know your background, maybe we ought to catch up on it. Did you have, you know, was this an event when you realized you had an ability like this? No, I always joke around and say I have a very boring story. I went for a psychic reading with a woman by the name of Lydia Clark. She was doing a, a house party at my grandmother's home. And um, think, think Tupperware party, take out Tupperware, bring in the psychic. That's what she was doing at my grandmother's house. <laughs> and I went to debunk her. I went to debunk her because I didn't believe this was possible. And I wanted to prove to my family that they were uh, being taken advantage of. So I went for this reading. And, woman changed my life. She's a, 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 she is an amazing, amazing psychic. So when did you f figure out that you could connect? Well, I didn't figure it out. She told me. She told, she told me in 1985 that I would be a well-known psychic and that I would be doing this work. I would, you know, write books about it. I would lecture about it. I'd be on TV and radio. And I remember I was like 15 years old. My greatest aspiration at that time was to own a deli. So I was like, <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Right. And um, it was after that experience. I just started learning more about it. And, and when you do it, uh, do you find that people are disappointed if you cannot read for them or you cannot oh, make that connection? Absolutely. One of the things that I'm very, very clear about is that mediumship is not a cure for grief. It is something that can assist a person on their path or on their journey of understanding about the loss of a loved one. And at the right time, it can be extremely helpful. But it's not the first thing I always say, you know, you should not like lose a relative, seek out a medium and like life goes on. Um, it's not something to depend on, it's something to understand. And if you really understand the process, which is what we do on Crossing Over, it's what I do when I lecture, it's to raise the awareness level the way Lydia Claw raised mine to say it's possible. Well, if it's possible, then you don't need a medium. And when your mother passed away, it got kind of more, more intense for you? Absolutely. It was a, when, when my, before my mom passed, from 1985 to 1989, I was, you know, a psychic. I kind of, I did the other side stuff, but it really had no significance. There was really nobody in important to me that had passed, I didn't really get that same kind of feeling from, you know, I, I, I didn't personally need it. And then in 1989, my mom passed, and then I felt like everybody else. I was like, oh my God, this is why people would seek out what I do. Then it became personal. And then it became personal to the point that I couldn't do it for myself because I didn't have the objectivity. Like, what could she possibly come through with to let me know? Well, you cannot do it for you. you I, not the way I can do it for somebody else because I don't have do the objectivity. you go to somebody? Um, I have a couple of friends who, who are very, very talented. And they, and they can connect with Abs your mom absolutely. and your other members of your family. Absolutely. And friends. It's like a doctor trying to operate on themselves. Right. You know, so it's like I would say to my mother, it's like, you want to say something to me? Go to Shelly Peck. You want to say something right. to me? Go to Suzanne Arthur. Right. You know, go, go talk to people that are going to be objective to be able to receive it. And when you hear it from a third party, it's a major validation because there's no way they should know this unless that person was telling them. Right. Now, do you censor out stuff? Oh, no. I sense of nothing. I, I will Even if there's... I see it here, let, feel let, it, say I it. I mean, let me give you a for instance. I mean, if, if someone who's passed over wants to talk about, let's say, breaking a marriage vow with somebody who's still alive, you just let it go? Let it fly. My rule is if I see it, I say it. Now, I, I will tell you that I've learned to recognize the fact that there is an interpretation process here and that I could be completely wrong, so I will preface my statements by saying, you know, I could be wrong with what I'm about to say, right. but I clearly want to let you know that this is where I think they're going. And sometimes what I think they mean is not what they mean at all. Now, John also has two best-selling books out. And there's a third book coming out this summer in August called Crossing Over. Now, what are you doing here? Crossing Over is kind of the, uh, you know, most of the time psychics are accused of not answering like the tough questions. So I'm talking about all the tough questions, things that people want to know about, you know, about uh, this work and, and earning a living at doing it and, and how I came to doing a, a television show about talking to the other side and answering, uh, there was something in the book, in the first book that I talked about uh, how my, I had a deal with my mother that she was supposed to come through and give me three signs and I wouldn't reveal them to anybody. And it took nine and a half years, I finally got them. Oh, really? I'm revealing them in this book. So it's like a whole bunch of things that are very, very private and personal that I'm talking about and crossing over.